this has been in the pipeline for quite some time. And I thought, let me go around and just do it. The bones break. It's a fracture. Let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be starting a series of orthopedic topics and we'll be looking at a very, very important topic which is fractures. This is general principles. So these are principles that you're going to need to understand or as a stepping stone for you to understand the different types of fractures that we have in the body. So it's not going to be focusing on specific fractures but rather the general principles that will help you understand the later topics as we learn about fractures. Here's a warm-up question, which is a true or false question. The sequence of local examination of a fracture is as follows. Look, feel, move. Inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. Inspection, palpation, and then move. Move, tap, and palpate. So keep the answer in your mind and write them down, screen them at your screen, I will give you the answer at the end of the video. So what are our objectives? Uh, we're going to be looking at the introduction of what fractures are, a little bit about fracture classification, describing fractures. We're going to be looking at the clinical assessment of a fracture, a little bit about fracture healing. It's quite similar to wound healing that we covered on the channel. We also look at the management of fractures and eventually the complications. Remember that fractures can be abbreviated as FRX or FX, sometimes a hashtag sign. So this is just simply defined as a partial or a complete break in the structural continuity of the bone that may or may not be associated with soft tissue injury. That's the only time where STI actually stands for soft tissue injury as opposed to sexually transmitted infection. Remember that the bone tissue is one of the tissues in the body that has the ability to regenerate and instead of it forming scar tissue. Same thing with the liver. When the liver is injured, it can regenerate as opposed to actually developing scar tissue in some instances. So how do we classify fractures? I want you to know these five different ways that we classify fractures. There's a clinical classification, anatomical classification, etiological classification, which is based on the injury mechanism. You have the radiological classification and a classification based on eponyms. So we'll begin with the clinical classification and oh, disclaimer, there may be some graphical images in this video. So these may be classified as open fractures, which are also referred to as compound fractures. These ones have a risk of infection because the bone is sticking out from the body. There is a break in the continuity of the skin, so there's a high risk of infection. These are considered as orthopedic emergencies. Then the closed fractures usually are also referred to as the simple fractures where there is no external communication with the bone and the external environment. So when you talk about open fractures, they may be caused by uh, direct trauma or sometimes even indirect trauma, whatever it may be leading to this, but there is a, a direct communication between the surface of the body and the fracture itself. So these ones have a risk of being contaminated by organisms. And like I said, these are considered as an orthopedic emergency. So the prognosis is largely dependent on the extent of the soft tissue injury, the type and the level of the bacterial contamination. So generally in your treatment plan, you want to include something that's going to prevent infection. So cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics, tetanus prophylaxis, restore the tissue. So daily wound cleaning, debridement of the wound, then you achieve bone union by reduction in immobilization. More or less, these patients do require theater. Then... Avoid any malnutrition, so cover them with a high-protein diet, and then early joint motion and muscle rehabilitation to prevent complications like uh, contractures. And on the other end, closed fractures, there is no communication between the site of the fracture and the exterior of the body. So these ones do not have a significant risk of infection as opposed to the open fractures. So that's the clinical classification. You actually need the patient to be there for you to determine that this patient has either an open fracture or a closed fracture. Then we have an anatomical classification, which is based on the anatomical location where the fracture has happened. For example, a fracture of the right radius. And these can either be proximal, middle, or sometimes even the distal ends of the bone. So this is very easy to know. Just know the anatomical names of the different bones. 
Then you have the etiological classification based on what has really caused this fracture. We can largely divide it into three main types, traumatic fractures, which can be as a result of direct force or indirect force. I'll talk about that in detail. You may have a stress fracture or a fatigue fracture. You may also have a pathological fracture. So we'll begin with traumatic fractures. So this is the most common type of fractures that we see. And these are going to be occurring in bones that are free of disease. And like I say, the fracture can be as a result of either direct force or indirect force. What do I mean by direct force? So the fracture is happening at the site of the impact. That's what we call as a direct force traumatic fracture. Then in indirect, the bone actually breaks at a distance where the force was not even applied. And these are often due to a combination of different other forces, perhaps twisting, bending, compression, even some tension forces. And they may actually even reveal certain different types of characteristics. Then you may have different radiological patterns that you may see based on the different forces that may cause the fractures. For example, you may have twisting force, which may lead to a spiral. You may have a compression, which may be a short or oblique line. You may have bending, which will give you a triangular butterfly fragment. You may even have tension, which can cause a transverse or sometimes even an avulsion of the small fragments of the bone at points of the ligaments and even tendon insertion. As you can see here, you have a spiral type and this is a compressive force. This is a twisting and bending force. Then this is, of course, tension force, which can even avulse different types of structures. Then what about stress or fatigue fractures? These are the ones that are going to be occurring in normal bones as well, but as a result of repetitive heavy loading, repetitive trauma. So these are very common in athletes. They're very common in dancers. They're very common in military personnel. And here you're going to be having these minute deformities that are initially going to be forming. And remember that there is something that's known as the Wolf's Law. Whenever you are breaking down bone, new bone is supposed to be laid down. So this whole process is known as bone remodeling. In more or less many times, in many times you're going to be having uh, a balance between bone resorption and bone formation. So whenever there is more prolonged stress and repetitive stress, there's going to be deformation and resorption of the bone that's going to be happening faster than it can be replaced. So this is going to be leading the bone to become susceptible to a fracture. So this is the same thing that's going to be happening in patients that are on drugs that actually do affect the bone resorption and the bone replacement. Then remember that the stress fractures are going to be affecting the metatarsal bones in more than 50% of the patients. Generally, you get this in the background of maybe a military recruit that's just training so hard, marching, doing all these drills, and then they just keep having this constant pain in their feet. And you can't really complain about it because you're going to be deemed as weak. But then when you actually get some scans of this, then you realize that they have a hairline fracture. Then it can also happen in the calcaneus in 25% of the cases, the shaft of the fibula and the tibia in 20%, even the neck of the femur. So the onset of the pain is actually going to be quite gradual then the pain actually gets worse with increased continual activity and it's going to be relieved by rest. So when you examine this patient, there may be marked tenderness over the affected bone, there may be swelling. And generally, when you look at the radiological features, they're going to be occurring only in about two to four weeks and they may actually even just show a faint hairline crack in the bone. So rarely there is displacement of the fragments. So the treatment is just pretty much to decrease the physical activities. So... Here, as we can see here, there is this hairline fracture over there. It, it's, it was happening in this bone. You can't really see so much happening here, but you can see that there is even some reaction that is happening in some callus that is beginning to form around this fracture. So this person had a hairline stress fracture. Then the last is the pathological fracture. Remember, we had a, a traumatic fracture, the stress fracture or fatigued fracture, then the last group is the pathological fractures. These are all under the etiological classification. So here the fracture is going to be occurring with a normal force or trivial force in a diseased bone. And remember that the pathologies that may affect the bone may either be localized or generalized. So you may have some cancers that do metastasize to the bones like thyroid, breast, prostate and renal carcinoma. Keep this in mind. They do ask you these things on your exams. Then when you treat the broken bone, you should also aim to address the underlying condition because if you haven't addressed the underlying condition, this patient most likely will continue having these fractures with just trivial trauma to the diseased bone. So 
A few causes could be infections like for example pyogenic osteomyelitis, bone tumors which could be benign, chondromas, giant cell tumors, you may have malignant tumors which are going to be including things like osteosarcomas, Airwings, metastatic carcinomas, multiple myelomas, and even some secondary bone tumors. Then you may have some congenital disorders like osteogenesis imperfecta, some diffuse rarefaction of the bone like senile osteoporosis, parathyroid osteodystrophy, infant rickets. You may even have Cushing syndrome. You may also have nutritional osteomalacia. So this is what the diseased bone is actually looking like. So as you can see, there's something that's going on here. A pathology that's going on with these bones and you can see that there's a large area of bone destruction here and we can see that there is a fracture that's over here so most likely this is a pathological fracture so we move on now to the radiological classification which is based on the x-ray view so this is just simply a description of the shape and the pattern on the radiograph so it may actually indicate or have an indication and tell us what caused the, the, the nature of the violence that caused the fracture, the clue to the easiest method of reduction, you may even have the stability of the fragments, and remember that fractures may be uh, complete or they may be incomplete based on radiology. So the complete fractures, this is where you have the fractures actually splitting into two or more fragments, so it may be a transverse fracture where the fragments usually remain in place after the reduction, it may be an oblique where they tend to shorten and they are easily redisplaced even after the bone is splinted. You may have a spiral fracture which tend to shorten and redisplace even post splintage. You may have an impacted fracture where the fragments are actually jammed together tightly and the fracture line is actually indistinct. You may have comminuted where you have fracture of more than two fragments being present. It's very different for, from segmental because segmental you have three fracture segments so the bone is actually broken or fractured at two different sites, creating three segments. So you have the incomplete fractures where the bone is incompletely divided, so the periosteum actually remains continuous on the other side. You may even have the cortex of the other side of the bone remaining intact. So you may have a green stick fracture where the bone is actually buckled or bent. These are seen in children. We don't want to see this type of diagnosis in adult. Green stick fractures are only seen in children. In adults, you may have green stick-like fractures, but they're not really green stick fractures. You may also have compression fractures, which occur with cancerous bones, and typically in adults, and the bones of the vertebra, the calcaneum, and the tibial plateau are the ones that are commonly affected. So this is what a green stick fracture looks like. As you can see here, you have the green stick fracture there uh, happening at the wrist, and here it's affecting the bones that are being found this appears to be the lower limb, so this must be the tibia, this must be the fibula. As you can see here, one bit or one half of the cortex on that side is uh, broken and on the other side it's intact. So both bones are fractured, that's a green stick fracture. Then here are other different types of patterns. So here you have a transverse fracture, an oblique fracture, a spiral fracture, a grossly comminuted fracture and a green stick fracture. Here is an example of a segmental fracture. As you can see, two fracture lines and three segments. One, two, three. Then you may sometimes have crash fractures which are happening in the vertebra of the bones. Then just to emphasize the point, transverse fracture, you may have a linear fracture and non-displaced fracture. A displaced compound fracture is even sticking out of the leg there. You have a spiral, you have a green stick, you have a comminuted. Just the different types of radiological patterns that you may see. Again, to emphasize the point, here's an open compound fracture, a closed simple fracture, a compressed fracture, a stress fracture, a avulsion happening, a green stick fracture, impaction, comminuted, and a transverse. Now, based on the eponyms, this is just simply the person that usually described the fracture or the person that first orig the originator of the fracture. So this is a type of classification system where we're going to be denoting specific injuries to specific names. So one which was famously known is known as a POTS fracture, which often just implied any fracture around the ankle. But though this is not what the individual that actually described this actually meant. So Sir Pot actually implied something different when he described the injury in 1970, 1965, but we actually use the Pot's fracture to denote a fracture around the ankle. 
So these are just based on the people that first described the fractures. So it could have been the Gastillo Anderson classification of open tibial fractures, Garden's classification for the fracture of the neck of the femur, near classification of proximal humeral fractures, Hansen classification of ankle fractures. You may even have a Weber's classification of ankle fractures. You, you may have your Muller uh, classification of fractures. This is just an alphanumeric classification of fractures that was developed by Muller and his colleagues. So here's just an example of the Muller classification. I'll just leave this on your screen. You may pause the video at this moment, get a screenshot of this. It's pretty much self-explanatory. Now, when you talk about fractures, there is an element of displacement that is there. Remember, we were discussing how we classify different types of fractures clinically, radiologically, based on the eponyms, based on the etiology, and based on whether they are either open or closed, based on whether they are complete or incomplete, based on whether they are traumatic or stress or pathological fractures, the things that we've been talking about. Now, when a fracture happens, there is an element of displacement that is a possibility. Sometimes displacement happens, sometimes it doesn't. So after a complete fracture, the fragments actually become displaced because of different things. One, because of the force of the injury. Two, because of gravity itself. Three, because of the pull of certain muscles in the body. So remember that displacement is going to be described in terms like Translation, which is also referred to as shift, alignment, rotation, and even outer length. So the types of displacement you could have would have translations or shift, angulation or tilt, rotation, impaction, and even overlap. So all the types of displacements can actually be corrected with manual closed manipulation, except for rotational displacement. So rotational displacement generally has to be corrected by your surgery because if it's not corrected remember all fractures are going to be healing and they may heal either normally or abnormally what you as a physician or you as an orthopedic surgeon are going to do is pretty much guide the fracture to heal in a normal way so when you come to talk about translation or shift so the fracture may actually be shifted sideways backwards or forward in relation to each other and usually the fracture is going to unite as long as there's sufficient contact between the two bones and between the two surfaces so this may occur even if the reduction is done imperfectly or even if the fracture ends are just touching each other or they're lying side by side. Fractures are going to be healing whether normally or abnormally it's you who's going to be making the large difference. Then you may have ang angulation, excuse me. The fracture is going to be tilted or angulated in relation to each other. There may be malalignment. If this is uncorrected, it's going to lead to a deformity of the limb. You may have rotation or twist where one fracture may be twisted on its longitudinal axis and the, and the bone may actually look straight but the limb actually ends up with a rotational deformity. Then you may have length displacement where the fractures may be distracted or separated. They may sometimes overlap because of the muscle spasms that can cause the shortening of the bones. So how do we describe fractures in a patient? So remember that generally when you're describing fractures, you want to use as many of those classification systems that I talked about. So you want to talk about the clinical classification, the anatomical classification, the radiological pattern, and the shift and the displacement that you have. So clinically, you ask yourself, is this an open or a closed fracture? Only comment on this when you see the patient is there and you can actually see the bone sticking out. Then anatomical classification, you ask yourself which bone has been broken, has the joint surface been involved? Then on your radiological uh, pattern, you can only comment on this when you actually have a look at the x-ray. So is this a transfer? So remember transfer fractures are very slow to join because the area of contact is quite very small. And if the broken surface is accurately opposed, then the fracture is stable on uh, compression. Then you may have some spiral fractures where the joints actually more rapidly, but is... Um, they heal more rapidly, but is actually not so stable as compared to the transverse. Then you have the comminuted, which are very slow to heal because there's more than one fracture segment that is there. And of course, there's often significant soft tissue damage, which makes them quite unstable. Then you also comment on the displacement. So you assess if there's any shift or translation backwards, forwards, sideways, or longitudinally with impaction or overlap. If there's any tilt or angulation sideways, forwards, or backwards if there's any twist or rotation in any different types of direction. So here's an example of how you'd actually describe a fracture. So you would say that this person has a closed transverse fracture of the shaft 
of the radius with no displacement. So this will give you an idea of what exactly is going on in this patient. So sometimes when you're talking about angulation, it's very difficult when you're talking about anterior angulation because this could mean like the apex of the fracture is going to be pointing anteriorly or it could mean that the distal fragment is the one that's tilted anteriorly. But when we actually use the term, we actually say that the anterior tilt is going to be the distal fragment which is pointing anteriorly as opposed to the apex of the fracture. So how do we assess clinically the history of a, uh, the rather clinical assessment of a fracture? We want to take the history, a physical examination. So we look at the general examination, we assess the general signs, we have, then we go on to do a local focused examination. So on the history, you want to actually have a history of the injury or what led to the injury. And the fractures uh, is not always going to be at the site of the injury. For example, someone would hit the knee, then the fracture happens at the patella. It may happen at the femoral condyles. It can happen to the shaft of the femur or even sometimes the acetabulum. So make sure that you inspect each and every single part of the bone. So you should ask what happened. Was there a lot of violence involved or it was a simple fall? So get both a direct history from the victim and a collateral history from a witness that may have witnessed whatever happened. How did it happen? So some injuries, according to the description, you can actually predict the type of fractures that you may actually see. Because force is really directed in a certain way, in a certain direction, that can cause the bones to snap in a certain direction. So where and when did it happen? Did it happen recently or has the patient come late? What was the patient like before it happened? Does the patient have any other medical problems? Ask also the last meal because they may need to actually go to theater. So we should ask about the patient's age and the mechanism of injury, very important, because again, trivial injury that is causing a fracture would be suspecting of a pathological lesion or a pathological fracture. Then you may also have uh, symptoms of pain, bruising, swelling, which are very common, but you can't really distinguish this from a soft tissue injury because if someone has a soft tissue injury, you still do have these features even when someone has a fracture or without a fracture. There may be a deformity, which is actually much more suggestive of a fracture. So always inquire about symptoms of associated injuries like pain and swelling elsewhere. It's actually common to be distracted by the main injury, especially if it's severe and you miss out something else. For example, you miss out that this patient actually has a pneumothorax because he's just focusing on the fracture. So you may also ask for numbness or loss of movement, skin Pala, you may be able to see on examination, cyanosis, blood in the urine, you can ask for that, abdominal pains, difficulties in breathing, or transient loss of consciousness. Ask if they've had any previous injuries. So once the acute emergency has been dealt with, you should ask if they do have any other prior injuries or musculoskeletal abnormalities that they are aware of that you may see on the x-ray that may confuse you. Then get a general medical history. This is very important, especially in preparing patients for anesthesia and preparing them for operation. So due to the medical legal implication that's going to be associated with accidents, fractures, and even any other injuries are quite important to meticulously make your notes at the right time and as soon as the event happens, as soon as possible, because this may have some medical legal implications if it goes to court. Then what's the physical examination like? So unless if it's quite obvious from the history that the patient has sustained a localized and fairly modest injury, the priority actually should be given to saving the patient. So it's like the trauma, traumatology course that I will talk about on the channel so that you follow the ABCs. So your airway, breathing, circulation, you address airway problems, breathing problems, circulation problems, and you make sure that there's a cervical collar until cervical spinal injury has been ruled out. So a quick start to actually clear out the airway and breathing is make sure you talk to your patients. Ask the patient what their name is. If you get a sensible answer, it means that the patient is conscious. So it means that's a good thing, that they are awake. It means that they have a good airway. It means that they are also breathing. Because someone who's not breathing and someone whose airway is not secure, they won't be able to respond to you in a sensible manner. Sometimes they may not even give you any output. So for most patients with actually a single or few injuries, the examination just usually concentrates on that part and the fitness for the patient anesthetics or anesthesia rather. So... In the secondary survey, because remember, this is a primary survey that you're doing. And in the secondary survey, it's going to be necessary now to exclude other previously unsuspected injuries and to be alert for any predisposing causes like Paget's disease of the bone, metastasis of bone tumors. So the general signs 
that the patient is actually going to be having. They may be in shock, so look for signs of shock or signs of hemorrhage. Look for any signs of associated damage to the brain, especially with head trauma. You look for any injury to the spinal cord or viscera or any other predisposing causes. These are very important to look for on the physical examination. So what are some of the local signs that may point us towards injuries and fractures? Remember that when you have an injury to tissue, it must be handled with, with care. It's not important for you to elicit crepitus to you that gritting sound that you actually create when the bones are rubbing against each other it's it's even quite cringe for me to actually even think about or even to to attempt to do to a patient the best thing that you can actually do is get an x-ray the x-ray is going to be diagnostic you can only maybe elicit this for if you in a setting where you don't actually have the facility to get an x-ray but get an x-ray wherever necessary so avoid any abnormal movements because they're painful. Avoid causing the, pa the patient any unnecessary pain. So examine the most obviously injured part. Test for the arterial and nerve damage. This is very important that you should be able to test for arterial damage. You should be able to test for nerve damage, especially with fractures because they carry a risk of damage to arteries. They carry a risk of damage to the nerves. So look for any associated injuries in the region. Look for any associated injuries in the distal parts. So what are we going to do? Remember the medicine is inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. So we first inspect, we look for any signs of swelling, bruising, deformities, any discoloration and loss of function. Then the deformities we should measure and record any angulation, rotation, translation, shortening, and these can also be better assessed on the x-ray. Then we should grade any wound that is present. So we should measure it accurately and grade it according to our Gastillo Anderson classification, especially this is in relation to open tibial fractures. So grade one, if the wounds are less than one centimeter or a simple fracture pattern, and there's no skin crushing, they're clean wounds with mild risk of contamination or even mild contamination. That's grade one. Grade two, the wounds are between one to 10 centimeters without significant soft tissue crushing, no flaps, no degloving wounds, no contusions. The fracture pattern may be much more complex and moderate contamination. Grade three is anything greater than 10 centimeters or any injury that is older than eight hours and severely contaminated. It may be 3A where there is no periosteal stripping, 3B where the periosteum is stripped away, and 3C where there is neurovascular damage. So you can use the mnemonic AA, BB, and CC to help you remember that AA is apparent opposition. So there is no periosteal stripping, the periosteum is still intact. BB for bone bare, the periosteum is stripped away, and CC for circulatory compromise, so there's neurovascular damage. So you should note the posture of the distal extremity, the color of the skin, because these are telltale signs of nerve and vessel damage. Then you come to palpation, which is feeling. So you palpate for any bony tenderness, any warmth, the distal pulses. You can even move the joint for crepitus, which is the scratching sound when the bones are rubbing against each other. But do not do this just to prove your point. You're better off getting an x-ray. Then grade the soft tissue damage. Grade 0 where there's little or no soft tissue injury. Grade 1 where there's a superficial abrasion with moderate swelling and bruising. Grade 2 there's a deep abrasion which also has tense swelling with bruising and blistering. Grade three, there is extensive contusion, tissue swelling, compartment syndrome, and even vascular damage. Then you come to movement, you, which is move. So we have inspection or look, palpation or feel, movement or move. So here, the abnormal movement, so like I said, do not cause the, the patient any unnecessary stress. So any abnormal movement was going to be causing further soft tissue damage, further periosteal stripping. So just do an x-ray for Christ's sake. Then we do get imaging for these patients. So there is what is known as the rule of twos that I like to use when we order imaging for these patients that are suspecting fractures. So the x-rays, you should do two views of the, the fracture. So an AP view and a lateral view. So this gives a better indication of the fracture and even the dislocation. For some injuries, like in the hand, you may even need a third view, which is an oblique view. The second point is that you should have two joints. So you should get an extra of the joint above and the joint below concerning that bone that has fractured. So if it's in the forearm or the legs, one bone may be fractured or one bone may be angulated. So the angulation is quite impossible to tell unless the other two bones or unless the other bone is also broken or the joint is dislocated. So you can only tell this if you have actually gotten a sufficient picture.
The third thing is that get an x-ray of both sides, two sides. So use this for comparison to see what is happening on the right side where there is a fracture with what is happening on the left side where it's supposed to be normal. Particularly, this is very important in children because it allows for you to compare the epiphyseal plates. It's very, very easy to confuse an epiphyseal plate in a child for a fracture. Because remember, epiphyseal plates have cartilage. So cartilage is radiolucent. So you may think it's a fracture. Meanwhile, it's an epiphyseal plate, especially in the child. Then, of course, repeat the x-rays on two occasions. So repeat it after one to two weeks later. Uh, so at the time of injury and also one to two weeks later. And then, of course, you should suspect that there are two injuries in certain types of forces. So severe forces often can cause injuries at more than one level. So look for two different types of injuries. So the fracture at the calcaneum or the femur is also important to look for uh, fractures of the pelvis as well as the spine. So remember that all x-rays should be centered on the area of maximum tenderness. And the radiological features that may point towards a fracture, you may get a lucency at the site of the fracture, which is just this dark line. You may get discontinuity of the cortex or the surface of the bone or joint. So an MRI is best suited for actually viewing the extent of soft tissue injury. An ultrasound may sometimes help in detecting joint effusions, but we rarely do that. You get a radioisotope bone scan also whenever it's doubtful. So you can do a radioisotope scan whether to check whether the bone is fractured or not, but we don't routinely do this as well. So this is useful in about two weeks after the injury. It's quite sensitive test, but it doesn't actually provide any information about the fracture except that the fracture is there. So even if you don't do it, it's not going to change the way you're going to be managing this. So for example, a scaphoid fracture, which may be seen on a second x-ray at two weeks, but there can still be some doubt. So a negative scan is a very positive, reassuring thing that there isn't a fracture and it's going to be allaying the anxiety that may be there and the clinical doubt that may be there. Then you may order for some blood tests, a full blood count for hemoglobin, hematocrit, and the detection of any infections, urea, electrolytes, and creatinine, because this patient has a risk of getting into shock, hemorrhagic shock, and this can lead to dehydration. It can lead to renal failure. You also do some liver function tests. Now, how do fractures heal? It's very similar to wound healing, so I won't go into so much detail about it. I'll just give you the highlights. So remember that as soon as the fracture or the bone is broken, healing is supposed to start. So this actually provides favorable and um, a conducive environment for the bone structure to meet together and complete the heal. So for the tubular bones, it's going to be happening in five main stages. So whenever you have injured or there is a fracture that is happening, remember that the fracture segments is going to result in rupture of blood vessels. And with this rupture of blood vessels, you have to arrest the hemorrhage. So you should form a hematoma in that area. You should also now begin the process of inflammation, bring in your neutrophils. So here there's going to be tissue damage, there's going to be bleeding, and there's an almost immediate response. Because remember when blood vessels are ruptured, they undergo this immediate transitory phase of vasoconstriction. And then after this phase of vasoconstriction and the formation of the initial platelet plug or the hematoma around this area of injury, there is eventually going to be vasodilatation to bring these inflammatory cells to this area of injury. Then we get into now the stage of cellular proliferation where there is a subperiosteal and endosteal cells. So here you get more of these inflammatory cells appearing. The neutrophils are going to be recruiting more other cells. Macrophages are going to be coming. And then you also have proliferation of the fibroblasts. And because remember, the fibroblasts are the ones that are eventually going to be laying down the matrix and then transforming into different types of cells. You also get your osteoclasts and the osteoblasts also being present here. So then you get into the stage of callus formation where now the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts are fully appearing, which takes about two to four weeks. So here the osteoblasts are going to be laying down new bone then the osteoclast will be removing any dead bone or any debris that may not be needed there. Then after you have now laid down this immature bone, remember you call this immature bone as woven bone, then you get into the stage of consolidation where the woven bone is going to be replaced by lamellar bone and then the fracture is going to be united. Then you get a stage of remodeling that's going to be happening may take some months, sometimes even some years, such that the bone may sometimes look like the normal bone, but it never really gets back to that pre-fracture state. So in the first week, you have inflammation and the hematoma. This is very important because when someone comes in with a fracture and we're managing it, we never send them home with a full cast because during the first week, we expect inflammation to be happening. So if you send them home with a full cast, they'll come back with a compartment syndrome and you'll actually even have to amputate that limb if it becomes gangrenous. So that's why we usually put a back slab 
or a half cast such that when they come back after a week and the inflammation has gone away, then we can put a full cast. Then you go into the stage of week two where there is now introduction of these inflammatory cells, differentiation of some of these cells and beginning formation of callus. And then by about three weeks or so, callus has already been formed. So remember that the proliferation of the osteogenic cells from the periosteum is going to give you your chondroblasts, which give cartilage, which may be replaced by new bone. And then osteoblasts are also going to be laying down some new bone matrix. The capillary invasion is also going to be happening of the hematoma here and capillaries are going to be forming in this stage somewhere around week two. So here is the different stages. So here it's fractured and then as you can see, it's healing, healing, healing. So even if it's in an abdominal position, it will definitely heal. So how do we manage? So remember that since bones are actually dynamic things and they are richly vascularized and they have a lot of nerves, so it means fractures are very painful. They have a risk of severe blood loss and the management is to minimize the pain, to splint it as much as possible and give them analgesic as much as possible, prevent any hypovolemic shock. So generally we want to treat the patient. We don't treat the fracture. So we give this patient first aid, so our ABCs, then resuscitation of the patient and treatment of shock, then a pain relief for this patient, then we treat the fracture. So remember, save the life first. So resuscitate the patient to your primary and your secondary survey, save the limb next, save the joint, then restore the function. So remember, all fractures are going to unite somehow whenever, wherever they will unite. So the, be aware of this difference that you can create in making use of it rationally. So you are the one who, who's going to be creating the difference of whether this fracture heals normally or it doesn't. So bone is actually the only tissue in the human body other than the liver that actually has the ability to, to regenerate instead of heal by scarring. And for this regeneration to occur, the bones must be mobilized to allow an interrupted formation of the new bone. So that's our immediate management. So we follow the ABCs, the airway obstruction, breathing problems, circulation problems, put a cervical collar. Like I said, talk to the patient. This will help you clear out all these problems of airway, breathing, and circulation. If they aren't there, there are certain maneuvers that can be done. We'll talk about this in detail when we look at trauma and how to manage trauma patients. Then resuscitate the patient, and there is a need sometimes for blood transfusion. I want you to be aware of these values. So there is significant blood loss that can happen with specific types of fractures. So with the major fractures of the pelvis, you can actually, this patient can actually lose about six plus units of blood. With the long fractures, uh, the bones of the uh, limbs, especially the femur, they could lose about two to three units or they may need two to three units. With the tibia, one unit. So in general, all patients with long bone injuries should be cross-matched because they need blood transfusions. Especially those with the pelvic fractures, they have a risk of losing a lot of blood, so they need to be transfused as much as possible. So gain venous access with the two large bowl cannulae, start running fluids, your normal saline, as you wait for blood. So also monitor the vital signs of this patient. Offer some pain relief. So systemic pain relief with opioids in adequate doses. You can actually combine this with antiemetics because opioids usually have a risk of causing nausea and vomiting. So if the patient is unconscious and the, there's a risk of respiratory suppression, avoid the opioids. So in injured patients, intravenous rather than intramuscular opioids should be used and clinicians should be particularly aware that when they um, are actually afraid of um, affecting the consciousness or the clinical signs of the patient. Generally, you should actually um, give this with so much caution, especially when you're dealing with head injuries or visceral injuries. You should exclude those before you decide to give this patient opioids. You may sometimes perform some local anesthetic nerve blocks, which are frequently effective. For example, a femoral nerve block can be used, um, for example, and it can actually remove the need for uh, systemic drugs following a femoral fracture although the anxiolytic benefits of the CNS agents should not be underestimated. Then splintage can actually be applied to most of the fractures when they arrive to the hospital. So they'll come in with maybe a cardboard box tied to their leg or maybe a stick that is tied to the leg. And this alone can actually relieve most of the intolerable pain. And generally a splint should encompass the joint above and the joint below if it's a good splint. So simple experience uh, such as binding of the arm to the chest with or without a sling or simply just binding the legs together sometimes is sufficient for the patient. So how do we treat the fractures? So we do bright, 
If it's an open fracture, it's considered as a surgical emergency, so we debride as much as possible. So surgical debridement is needed, and we should perform this as soon as possible, preferably within six hours of the injury. So if it's a wound that is left open or closed by secondary procedure after a few days, uh, to leave the healing to happen spontaneously in some cases, but patients actually need a supplementation of broad spectrum antibiotics. They need some form of tetanus prophylaxis to be given to this patient. And even in some cases, human antitetanus globulin can actually be given for those that do not have a previous active immunity. So the treatment of the fractures is going to be including reduction of the fracture, immobilization, and rehabilitation. So with reduction, you just want to restore the displaced fragments into the anatomical positions. So we want to correct the axial alignment, correct the rotational deformities, restore the length, and restore the joint alignment. So the methods of reduction, you could use closed reduction. So this is used when the fractures are not displaced and displacement is unlikely to happen. So it can be done under general anesthesia. We call this as a manipulation under anesthesia or MUA. Sometimes we may perform open reduction, which is often accompanied with internal fixation, which we call ORIF. Then sometimes traction can be used. We'll talk about traction in another video. So this here is just the picture of a fracture being manipulated with closed manipulation. So after you have reduced the fracture, whether it's open or closed, the next thing is to hold it into place, so it's to immobilize it. So when you immobilize or stabilize, you keep the fracture segments in a position until they are able to unite. So the fixation can also be closed fixation or open fixation. You may have casting or splintage, you may have functional bracing, you may have internal fixation, you may have external fixation. So with the casting and the splintage, this is where now we're going to be reducing the fracture and we keep in place with a plaster of uh, Paris. So this is the cast that I was talking about. So remember in the first week of the injury, we're expecting some significant inflammation. So we usually put a half cast. And when they come back, we change that and convert it to a full cast. So the fracture must be held in position that maintains its three dimensions. So it should be in a functional position. So tilt, twisting, and shifting. And the cast must be of a proper length. So it must be covering above the joint. The joint above, it should be covering the fracture, obviously, and the other joint or closer to the other joint below. So in order to ensure that there's complete control of all the dimensions of the fracture and there is no twist, shift, or um, tilt, then we should actually have it above the joint above and the joint below and so that these movements can be prevented. So the plaster of Paris is actually relatively brittle. It's quite messy to actually do and sometimes difficult to apply in certain types of fractures. It becomes very heavy for the patient. It can be awkward and particularly in elderly patients, it's not so effective and it takes three days to fully dry and patients are actually not supposed to bath with it because it's becomes weak as it's exposed to more water it can easily break so when they're bathing they should make sure that they cover it away from the water so they're not quite versatile as the the um, other methods but you can use the plaster of paris and they are better for secondary casts and they can be applied a week or two weeks after the fracture swelling has settled like i told you then splintage can be done to hold them the fracture segments together until they unite, then the joint movements and function must also be preserved when you're putting those uh, plaster of Paris. So here's an example of a plaster of Paris, and here's an example of the different types of splints that you can actually use. It's a pretty much self-explanatory thing. We'll go into details of this when we talk about specific different types of fractures. Then you may have functional bracing, which has many disadvantages. One, it's quite heavy. Two, it immobilizes the joint and prevents access to the fracture. And of course, the immobility can actually result in muscle wasting. It can actually result in joint stiffness. So the functional bracing actually overcomes uh, the above disadvantages. That's with, um, rather, the disadvantages I talked about are with casting. Now, the functional bracing overcomes this because the joint can actually freely move and it, the fracture segments are usually aligned together well and the functional bracing is actually highly dependent on a very accurate fit and it can only be used after a few weeks when the pain and the swelling has actually subsided. So in practice, the functional bracing is actually used for the management of fractures of the tibia and the fibula. Then you may have internal fixation, which is technically very demanding, requires some expertise to do because you have to take the patient to theater. So it is fixation that is actually used to achieve the 
unite to make the bones closer to each other so that they can easily unite in a number of ways. So you can do this by apposition. Once the fracture has been realigned, then they may only be held in apposition for healing to actually proceed satisfactorily. This is particularly true for the children. So apposition is actually done with these semi-flexible wires, which you call as K wires. The K stands for Krishna wires. So you can use Krishna wires and they hold the fracture segments in place without actually producing a mobility and the healing can actually occur naturally by the callus formation, then they can be left to be standing uh, proud of the bone and can actually be easily be pulled out once the union has been established and before consolidation. Then you may have interfragmentary compression, which is usually achieved by screws and with some tension band wires that can be used. So these actually are going to be achieving a great accuracy and particularly valuable in cancerous bones around the joints. They are also quite useful in the long bones, particularly in the upper limb. And in these situations, extra support is actually required from the use of the device. So the use of onlay device. So an onlay device, these are usually metal plates that are used as a buttress to support the weaker structures like for example around the joints they may sometimes be used to fix the long bones in the upper arm and they're actually these rigid systems that uh, are going to be inhibiting the natural bone union and although they are going to be permitting early movement they actually ultimately delay healing and the full load bearing then you may have some intermedullary or inlay devices. So the onlay devices are on the outside of the bone. The inlay devices are on the inside. So these are the most satisfactory method for fixation. So they achieve alignment without unduly disturbing the natural bone healing process. They are relatively inaccurate method of restoring anatomical position. And they're not so useful around the joints. They have great strength, which makes them an ideal device for treating the long bone fractures, particularly those in the lower limbs. So here are the different types. So here you have a cannulated screw uh, fixation. Here you have compression hip screw fixation in the side plate. Here you have a blade uh, plate fixation. So again, here is what it looks like on x-rays with these nails that are being inserted there into the bones of the femur, or rather the screws. Then you can have external fixation where the fracture is actually uh, open and is associated with quite extensive soft tissue damage and contamination is a risk. So neither plaster of Paris nor internal fixation is actually appropriate. So the plaster splintage is actually quite unsuitable for wounds that uh, become inaccessible for inspection and for dressing, while its external fixation is hazardous because it carries a high risk of infection. So a compromise um, situation is to actually apply an external fixation device, which is going to be these strong metal rods that run parallel to the uh, fractured bone and then they are going to be attached to the bone by a series of pins. So such devices actually can stabilize the fracture, they can give access to the soft tissues for dressing and even secondary surgery such as skin grafts and a big disadvantage of this is that you may sometimes get infections at the site of the pin. So here is an example of external fixation in the lower limbs and in the upper limbs. Then you may sometimes use traction to as a me means of immobilization so usually this is done with weights and it can either be skin traction or skeletal traction which we will discuss later on then after you have immobilized the fracture you should actually rehabilitate this patient so this should start as early as possible so the aim here is to maintain the functions of the uninjured part and once the fracture has united restoring the functions of the injured part so physiological load um, loading of the bone so the muscle activity and early weight bearing are actually encouraged because rehabilitation exercises are going to be preventing edema they prevent joint stiffness they prevent muscle wasting and atrophy they prevent dvt they enhance fracture healing and they also prevent contractions so here's a overview or summary of the treatment at a glance so we treat the pain and exclude the risk of serious blood loss most low energy fractures are not going to be associated with blood loss but pelvic and long bone fractures are, so we calculate the potential blood loss. We reduce the fracture, so we do this by sim simply and safely as possible. We restore the, the function. We hold the fracture in a functional anatomical position. So this can be with a cast or during operations and inserting fixation devices such as nails, plates, and screws. We can sometimes apply external fixation 
where there is extensive soft tissue damage and we can use weights to apply gentle traction. Then we rehabilitate the patient, so work with the rest of the team of healthcare professionals to include nurses, physiotherapists, occupational therapists to actually rehabilitate this patient. So no one single patient actually is just treated by one person. Then what are some of the complications of fractures? They may be early, which are due to either direct consequence of injury or in association with the treatment, or they may be remote or late, which are generally related to the fracture, but a few of them are unfortunately precipitated by the treatment or sometimes even the lack of treatment. So early complications include hemorrhage, so they may lead to shock, internal or external hemorrhage. The femur fracture, you may lose about two liters of blood. So ready, remember those units that I was telling you that you should actually put aside to transfuse these patients. Tibia, you may lose half a liter. Pelvis, you may lose three to five liters. You may have a hematoma, you may have nerve or vascular injury, you may have soft tissue injury like viscera, urethra, you may have tendon injuries. Immediate, intermediate complications include infections, fat embolism, osteomyelitis, septic wound or septic, septicemia in compound fractures, a, vas, a vascular necrosis, compartment syndrome, which is caused by localized swelling, joint stiffness, Volkmann ischemic contractures, thromboembolisms. Then you may have late complications, malunion, where they, this may lead to late neuropathies, valgus deformities at the elbow. You may have uh, this happening due to poor supervision of the healing. You may have nonunion, where they fail to unite, which is usually due to excessive movement, insufficient movement, sometimes even a poor local blood supply due to either the anatomy, for example, in the tibia, or just due to the trauma itself, which was quite extensive, or delayed union. You may sometimes have growth arrest in children due to epiphyseal damage. You may have osteoarthrosis, which is common in particularly um, fractures, um, in particular fractures and generally easily displaced. You may have joint instability or deformities. You may have post-traumatic atrophy, osteochorosis, which is hardened brittle, brittle bones. You may have osteoarthritis, shortening of the bones. You may have intraarticular and periarticular adhesions, hypostatic pneumonias, DVTs, and pressure sores. And then what are some of the causes of non-union? You may divide them as local versus systemic. Local causes include local infection or sepsis, interposition of soft tissue, inadequate or poor local blood supply, which is common with the neck of the femur fractures, inadequate immobilization, bone loss or crushing, overtraction, which causes loss of opposition between the fracture segments, iatrogenic, sometimes using the wrong open reduction and internal fixation method, local malignancies, which may cause bone destruction, severe communication, extensive opening, dissolution of the fracture hematoma by synovial fluid bathing the joints. Then you may have systemic complications like or systemic causes of non-union like anemia, poor general health, mineral and vitamin deficiency, especially calcium and vitamin D, metabolic disorders such as uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, hyperthyroidism, acidosis actually even also helps with destroying bone, lack of androgens and even estrogen hormones. Now coming back to our warm-up question, the sequence of local examination for fractures is look, feel, move, that is true. Inspection, palpation, percussion and auscultation, not really. With the local fractures, not really. Inspection, palpate and then move, that is true. Move, tap and palpate, that's not true. I really hope you learned quite a lot considering fractures, the general principles. This was a very long lecture and I will see you in the next video where we will talk about other different fractures in future and go into now details of the specific different types of fractures that we have in the body. But for now, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notification of such videos every time I post. Drop a comment, drop a like to Zambia and beyond. Until next time, bye-bye.